With a three-game losing streak on the line, Winnipeg wanted to make right and end the streak and start a new winning streak, this time against the Vancouver Canucks. The Jets came away a big 4-2 winner over the uh, Canucks, a team that they've handled recently pretty well, but with the injuries and fatigue setting in, maybe some concerns about how the Jets would handle this one. Thankfully, they got it done on special teams as the even strength scoring was unfortunately hard to come by. We'll walk through how the Jets pulled it off and some surprising results on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. Or Locked On, the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, Odyssey, and YouTube. Doing so is completely free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we just really love and appreciate your support. Now, on tonight's episode, like I said, we're going to walk through the game against Vancouver, which was a nice 4-2 victory. Although maybe the lack of 5v5 goals is a little bit of a concern. Uh, Colin Delia in net for um, the Canucks, I thought, had a, a pretty solid outing. You know, he's, what, like the third stringer? Not exactly somebody that was expected to be uh, you know, coming into this team and, and really putting on a big performance. But, you know, given that Demko and Spencer Martin haven't exactly been having the best past couple of uh, couple of months for Vancouver, Delia, I think it's stepped in. I don't know if one of them is injured. I think it might have been Demko who's out for some time or something. But Delia, I, I thought, had probably as strong of an outing as you could possibly ask against a team that, you know, look, the, the Jets are – you know, shorthanded right now. They don't have exactly have a ton of high-end goal scoring talent, but they still have a really good top six, and that can be enough to put a team like Vancouver under some serious pressure, especially if they get themselves into penalty trouble, which they did. Uh, Vancouver, especially after a quieter first period in which they mostly controlled the play, after that, you know, the second period and onwards, Winnipeg started really pl- applying the pressure, kind of remembering that Vancouver wasn't so good and ended up forcing the Canucks to take penalties, uh, commit turnovers, and just generally be bad. I mean, that that's kind of the best way to describe it. You know, Winnipeg really didn't do much in the opening 20 minutes, but that last 40 minutes, Winnipeg not only dominated Vancouver, they also kind of shredded them in the slot and really shut down most of their offensive counters. They very rarely got offensive looks after that opening 20 minutes. Uh, Any of the shots that they did take were either on the power play or off some good rush counters. But for the most part, you know, Vancouver just really wasn't getting a look in this game. Um, And you you could kind of tell that frustration was setting in. We saw one of the strangest things I've ever seen. Uh, You know, Colin Delia was trying to figure out whether to come off the ice or not for the extra attacker, obviously being down three to two uh, with about a minute or two left in the game. You know, Delia is looking over at the bench waiting for the signal and JT Miller curls back with the puck in his own zone, and he's actually yelling at him to get off the ice, and then slams his stick on the crossbar after Delia had already started leaving, and you just don't really see something like that on a team that's got good communication and that has a healthy work environment. Uh, You know, Miller has certainly been maligned by a lot of Canucks fans recently, and it's looking like that relationship has soured very quickly, so we'll see how that one pans out, but You know, the Canucks, they're just in a lot of trouble, and I don't really know, you know, what what sort of strategy they have to try and fix it. In this game, you know, Winnipeg took a a really good advantage of their poor defensive structure, their poor PKs, and the questionable goaltending, although I can't really say that Delia could really be faulted for most of the shots against. I think he did as much as he could. Vancouver just got pulverized, you know, from the second period onwards and really didn't do anything offensively in the third period. So, um, great for the Jets. Mark Shifley capped off a hat trick, which was pretty freaking awesome. Uh, we all know that Shifley has had a pretty monster year, and this just continues that trend. I mean, he's been onwards and upwards the entire season. He's, you know, refreshed and looking as good as he possibly can. 
And, you know, it's really important for Winnipeg that he does well, especially during this injury crisis, because, you know, as Shifley goes, the rest of this team goes. You know, Hellebuck certainly backstops Winnipeg to many of its victories, but he can't score goals. So it's going to be up to that first and second line, whatever combination that, um, you know, Bones runs out there. They're going to have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. And thankfully, this game, they did it especially on the power play. Like I said, no even strength goals, but a couple of really nice tips um, and some very crafty uh, passing and distribution for the power play units. Ended up seeing Shifley deflect a couple on net and pass Delia to give the Jets a nice lead, and that's all you could really ask for. Uh, Dubois also had a beautiful penalty shot. He was an absolute pest. I posted on Twitter that he actually reminds me a little bit of Buff these days. Uh, constantly mixing it up, constantly uh, kind of jawing and, and occasionally taking some very um, silly penalties here and there. We all know that he likes to kind of get in everyone's faces and piss off the competition. I'd really like to know what Apologies, we just dropped that for a brief second. I was just saying that, you know, Dubois is a huge pest, uh, really influential in this game. And I think long term, you know, one question I have with him is, has he changed his mind about potentially moving to Montreal? If he wants to stay around, I mean, I, I would certainly hope the Jets would be extending him a long term contract. I mean, he's been a beast for the Jets. Uh, and, and this season in particular, we're seeing, you know, all of the highs and lows with him, but mostly the highs. The lows, you occasionally see some soft plays or some uh, lazy turnovers or something, but for the you know the brilliance that he brings, it's unmistakable. The guy is an absolute force of offense, a super phenomenally creative player, a guy who has the passing and vision to execute, and has excellent chemistry with Kyle Connor. So, you know, I I feel like maybe he should rethink it. The Habs are a mess. The Jets look like a team that in the near future could potentially have some really good years, uh, and it seems like the guys are getting along now. So. Why, you know, hit the road and, and take your, your your carriage elsewhere when you've got a pretty good thing going in Winnipeg? And look, I know the, the you know, the city of Winnipeg may not be the most attractive destination of free agents, but sometimes when it comes down to it, you know, if your team is winning and you're winning a lot of games and you're putting yourself on a pretty good pathway to a playoff spot and to a deep run, that can be enough to kind of, you know, overlook some of the maybe less attractive, you know, living destinations. So Let's hope the Jets keep on racking up those wins so that, you know, guys like Dubois and uh, additional talent that the Jets attract can start coming in and celebrating with us. Now, there are some other interesting takeaways from this game that I think are really worth pointing out. Uh, one or two scares as well. Thankfully, nothing serious this time, but the Jets did have to dodge one or two major bullets. And we'll talk about those in just a little bit. Uh, a little bit. But before we go any further, I don't want to shout out uh, a really important safety thing from the NHTSA. They've got a major announcement um, and just something to put on your awareness and radar as, of course, we're rolling into New Year's and New Year's Eve, and a lot of you might be heading out on the roads, maybe celebrating with some friends. Make sure that you drive home sober. You're hanging out with some friends and family, and you're putting back a few drinks, and you know a, a few becomes too many, and you're starting to think, well, how the heck am I going to get home? You think about it and you're thinking, well, you know what? I, I can get behind the wheel. It's safe enough. I can drive home, right? You know, what's the worst that could happen? There's no there's not going to be anyone who pulls me over. But if I do get pulled over, maybe I get some points on my license. Maybe I lose my license. Maybe I lose my job. Maybe I get into a car accident. Maybe I kill someone. You know, everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk, but too many people end up overlooking them anyways and making tragic and fatal mistakes. You know, that's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads. They're looking to save lives, and you can help. If you think it's okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or somebody else's. Drive sober or get pulled over. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. We were just recapping some broad takeaways from Winnipeg's win over uh, the Vancouver Canucks, but I thought there were some, you know, more minute details that are worth taking a look at, and uh, some obviously some great props for Sam Gagne for his 1,000th game. Before we get into that stuff, though, just wanted to recommend that you make your second listen of the day, Locked On Sports Today. It features the biggest stories around the sports world in 20 minutes or less. You get instant reactions, big game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. 
Locked on Sports Today is available on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube, so be sure to subscribe right now because, as always, it is free and we appreciate your support. Now, you know, for Sam Gagne's 1,000th game in the NHL, obviously he's had quite an interesting career, a bit of a career journeyman all over the NHL, got drafted by the Oilers and has, has spent, you know, the last, I don't know how many years, probably 10 or so, maybe more. He, he's basically been all around, and this is a guy who puts in really hard shifts. Uh, since joining the Jets, he's actually been a fantastic veteran at some games, you know, maybe maybe not as noticeable as you'd like. This game, I thought that he had some, you know, struggles here and there, but, you know, for the most part, his Jets tenure has been great. Um, and I think he's, what, like 33, 34? You know, he's been around the block a couple of times. He's got that veteran savvy and experience, and he just seems like he really enjoys playing hockey. I mean, the guy constantly has a big smile on his face. You know, he he feels like an easy guy to root for. And, you know, ever since he, he kind of left Edmonton, which kind of felt like he was under the microscope all the time, I think it's been really good for his career. Um, and since joining the Jets, you know, he's been a really nice find. He's fit in well with the culture. I think tactically he's been a really great passer and shooter. You know, we see some of his work on the power play and you know, he's got some great goals this season, so I'm really happy for him. Congrats to, you know, reaching a 1,000 NHL games. That is a remarkable achievement. Not many people who have played the sport have gotten that far. And, you know, for, for him to have the longevity and to remain healthy enough to stay through all of those 1,000 games and also, you know, kind of deal with stuff like demotions and all of that jazz, it's amazing to hit that career milestone. So, Happy uh, a thousand games to you, Sam, and here's to many, many more. Hopefully, with a few extra goals added and just for fun. Now, uh, aside from this being Gagne's a, a thousandth NHL game, it was also, I think, a really big coming out party for Vili Heinola. We've talked about Heinola before in previous games, but for the most part, I would say a lot of his performances for the Jets were either not particularly special, maybe a little safe and conservative to recently looking more defensively oriented but sheltered, right? Not really facing hard matchups, not playing a lot. Well, for once, uh, even with some sheltered minutes in this game, Heinola kind of got run out there a lot more, uh, especially because Morrissey ended up taking a bit of an injury knock. Apparently nothing too serious. He is expected to play over the weekend against the Oilers. But, you know, Heinola for a lot of this game in the third period was playing tons. And even before then, he was getting a number of shifts on things like the first power play unit. Um, did take him a while to start earning those shifts, though. And once he kind of got onto the ice, you saw a different form of him. Previously, he was making safe plays, not doing anything particularly assertive. Tonight, though, he was really driving around with the puck, you know, cutting through the neutral zone, attacking the offensive zone with controlled entries, dump-ins, just about everything you could imagine. He was definitely weaving out of the defensive zone to create zone exits. He was doing it all. Tons of touches on the puck, some great passes, and I thought I, I was really impressed with his defensive reads where he would intercept puck carriers effectively, get the interior positioning, force turnovers. He did it to Connor Garland, did it to a number of other skaters as well. And even if he wasn't always winning physical battles, I thought that his, um, his stick usage was disruptive enough, and I thought in general he just had a really good game. And one of the biggest things that he brings to this Jets team, even if he's not scoring, is that transition skating. His ability to ferry the puck up the ice is a massive boon to this team, and one that, frankly, the back end just lacks. And he does all of this on the off side, right, on the right side. And so I think it's starting to push towards the idea that, you know, Neil Pionk is kind of the odd guy out. Pionk had another terrible game, unfortunately. Wasn't the only defender who had a few struggles. Uh, Sandberg, unfortunately, had a rough start to the game, ended up, you know, directly contributing to a goal against, ended up stabilizing after that first period. But, um, you know, in terms of, of blue liners out there, I think in terms of like the defensive impacts that I saw, for me, Heinola actually had the first star of this evening. Uh, he just made so many good plays. He was very patient, but assertive. And he effortlessly transitioned the puck up the ice and spearheaded breakouts, which, you know, the Jets just don't have a lot of. Morrissey can do it. Uh, Schmidt, when he's healthy, can do it. But aside from that, who else would you really trust with it? Pionk often skates the puck into trouble. Dylan is a more defensively oriented type. And DeMello can do it sometimes, but it's not really his game. He's more of that complementary two-way defender with defensive acumen and puck smarts, but maybe not the kind of guy 
that is like chaperoning the puck up the ice and really leading that offensive charge. If Heinola had been run out more frequently with a top line, I think he might have actually come away with a point. A couple of times he almost did. Uh, a couple of great passes here and there, some great slot charges. Um, just a few puck bounces maybe would have changed his fortunes. But overall, this was Heinola's best game as a Jet by a country mile. A really important performance for him to really lay claim to maybe even a top four spot down the road. But, you know, for this season, obviously the Jets do have a bit of a log jam, but maybe not for much longer. We'll see. Something to keep an eye on, but, you know, if you were hoping that Heinola would have a confident performance and one where he showed off his defensive smarts, this was the game for you. Now, in just a little bit, we'll talk about the uh, Edmonton Oilers and how the Jets are going to have to handle this team because the Oilers, despite being as, as flawed and as occasionally dramatic as the Vancouver Canucks are, still a very dangerous team uh, and one that I think Winnipeg is going to have a very tough time against, especially with how many goals they continue to score. Hey, friends, and welcome back to this episode of uh, Locked on Winnipeg Jets. We're just closing out with some final thoughts before Winnipeg takes on the Edmonton Oilers on the road this weekend. It's going to be a bitter battle. It's going to be a really tough one. Every time the Jets play the Oilers, it is uh, a bit of a slog, let's be honest. And it's not because the Oilers are particularly great in any respect. It's more like um, there's one particular matchup issue that the Jets do kind of have, and that's against Connor McDavid. And would anybody be shocked? I mean, it's Connor freaking McDavid. This guy this season has 67 points in 36 games. 67 in 36 games. That's like insanity. I mean, how many players in NHL history in the modern era do you see putting up numbers like this? He has as many assists as he has games played, and he's tacked on 31 goals on top of that. Drysaddle's not far behind him with, well, I, I guess it really is actually far behind him. He's got only 57 points, which is kind of nuts when you think about it. But, I mean, you look at this top six for the Oilers, they have so many uh, double-digit point scorers all up and down. But the thing that they continue to struggle with is goaltending uh, and defensive structure. Jack Campbell has not been good. Stuart Skinner has been um, better, I would say. Skinner has you know, had a, a positive save percentage, you know, 916 or so, which isn't so bad. But, I mean, this Oilers team, it just feels like they're very inconsistent, right? Uh, in net, it's just been a, a bit of a 50-50 gamble. And, like, the Oilers offense can certainly outscore most of their opponents, but last several games they've kind of had issues. I mean, they, they are certainly conceding lots. It's not been pretty. Uh, they've lost to the Ducks and Predators in the past week or so. They um, then lost to the Canucks as well. And sure, they did beat the Stars and the Flames, but to lose to three teams that are right now bottom feeders in the NHL on top of a, a recent loss to um, the Blues as well. I mean, this team is just all over the place. Now, I think Edmonton does have the potential to give the Jets fits because McDavid's line is probably going to be hard matched against uh, Shifley's line, I would say. Uh, but realistically, Winnipeg just... They're not really going to have any single line that can, I, I would say, defensively shut him down. The only hope is that Neil Pionk maybe remembers that he plays like a Norris candidate against McDavid and has like the game of his life. But yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a tough one. I, I think the Jets are going to have to be really disciplined, stay off the off the PK, and hope that they can get some power plays because um, the Oilers' PK is kind of eh. It's a little bit average. And honestly, I think the Jets are going to have issues scoring at even strength especially if Skinner is in net. So hopefully the Jets can come away with at least a point. I'm going to be honest, I'm expecting a loss. Um, so even if the Jets were just to you know, be able to get it to either the shootout or overtime, I'll take either. I don't really care. Uh, would love both points, but I think we have to be realistic with where the Jets roster is right now. Guys are, are taking a while to heal up. So let's just hope that Winnipeg can go out there, put on a good show, and give us a fun weekend. Let me know what you're expecting this weekend. Uh, what do you think the scoreline is going to be? Drop your predictions below in the comments, either in the YouTube comment section below or at my social medias at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. Make your second listen Locked On Sports today. 
Peter Bukowski brings you the biggest stories from around the sports world in 20 minutes or less. Get the analysis and opinions before anyone else with our local and national experts and insiders. Locked on Sports Today is available on all of your favorite podcasts and platforms, so be sure to like, follow, and subscribe right now. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great night, and go Jets go.